So, bad story idea. I'm excited. Give us a bad story idea. All right, bad story idea. This is another world building idea because it's me. Um, This was a couple years ago that I came up with this one. And then I immediately discarded. I'm like, you're getting a little too weird, Brandon. (laughs) I wanted to have a world that took place on a giant sphere that a giant being was pushing around another sphere. Okay, wait, so... So, so there is this giant moon-sized thing Mm -hmm. that... um, So, so far, we're just a planet. A planet, but it actually sits on another... Connects to... More gianter. Physically touches. Like a marble, yes. Physically touches, like like sitting on on this other ginormous, giant, you know, gas giant-sized thing. Mm -hmm. And there is this thing that pushes it around. Rolls it like some Sisyphus who just yes. rolls. Sisyphus this, is rolling, walking around the giant thing, and that is your 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 world. And you live on the poles, and and and, and the characters live on the the little yeah. one, not yes, the big the one. the little one. And the big one is like got very like rich soil or something or whatnot. So it's like getting stuck into it and pulling off pieces of it and whatever that substance is you need to harvest. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so. <laughs> You're giving me, wow, Brandon, this one's actually bad. It's so weird. Because before they were kind of bad, but they weren't really bad. This one's, yeah. So so is is that it? Is that all you've That's got? That's all I got. <laughs> That's my story idea. Okay. Living on the world that yeah. a giant so, is pushing oh, man. around another world. That is crazy. And the giant like. pushes it mm-hmm. at a consistent enough yes. rate to mm-hmm. create like reliable gravity. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know. Gravity, whatever, you know. We're talking okay. about it being the size, bigger yeah. enough to push a moon around. Mm-hmm. We're not worrying about physics at yeah. this point. We're, we're definitely not. Yeah. Uh, and he's leaving big handprints in it. Yes, big handprints, and uh, you're ripping up pieces of whatever other planet. Yeah. Uh, and they're sticking to it, and but they have to degrade or fall off some way so that you don't end up with just, uh, you know. So it's not just a snowball. Yeah. So it doesn't turn a, into a crewing that. size. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um. I mean, the the kind of the standard procedure, right, mm-hmm. with the story idea or a world building idea is you find the the points of conflict in the story. Yes. Uh, what does this world make possible, and mm-hmm. specifically, what does this world make difficult? Yes. And so the first place my mind goes is, well, if all the stuff sticks in that narrow band that touches the other world, you've got to run in and get the stuff. And then run back out before, before it you rotates flattened. around again yes. and you get squished. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like living on the borders, and it'd be really fun because if you're living on those borders, like you're gonna watch the visual of almost colliding with the other world, right? Because mm-hmm. you're right on that rim. You're gonna you're gonna be able to you'd be able to go stand a distance and watch kind of like as a glacier collapses or something like that sort of mm-hmm. uh we are the the world is is the worlds are connecting uh the impact yeah. points mm-hmm. um and it'd be extra cool if you had to like build stuff over there like mines you had like a couple of weeks maybe to get to mine down in and then you had to watch like the former Sid village get crushed by this thing yeah <laughs> um it would also makes certain things uh, temporarily unavailable. Yeah. Like if there were key, maybe not resources, but sites, temples, mm-hmm. um, something like that. Like if could could you have a bunker yeah. that you go into and uh-huh. then it gets flattened against the other planet and then it finally comes back again and you are able to step out and say, I have communed with the great whatever. Yeah, I actually, in the back of my head, like one of the 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 twist could be somebody doing that, right? Finding a way to survive the whole cycle mm-hmm. um, and, and come back around. Yeah. Um, but what, what stops people from just jumping from one planet to oh, the other planet? I think planet? that the, on the other planet, something awful's got to be going on. Like, it's got to be like, I don't know, super um, cold or super hot. Or, or, or the guy is yeah. pushing mm-hmm. the big planet marble through mm-hmm. what's essentially just like a mass of bugs. Okay. And that's the resource you got to harvest is, oh, look, we can go get organs from these slugs that got squished. And uh, if they're alive on the big planet, we can't 
get anything from them. But now that they're dead and squished onto this planet, we can go and get their things. I had this classy idea, and you're now mashing <laughs> bugs in it, Dan. Well, you I was going to say writers. worms first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like nasty tentacle worms. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where my bright mind goes somewhat sometimes. Yeah. Um, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. That one's probably not uh, high on the list. Um, that's but... crazy. Honestly, anytime you come up with an incredibly out there mm-hmm. world... Yeah, I want to put it into Apocalypse Guard. Ah, uh, yeah. Because I'm like, okay. Yeah, you could totally put this one in Apocalypse Guard. Yeah, because yeah. they you, we don't have to stay there long, and mm-hmm. we don't have to explain how it exists. It's just the idea that oh, this is that version of Earth that someone is rolling around a different version of Jupiter for some reason. Yep. And it all works and makes sense. Um, don't ask too many questions. Just imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's the that's the issue. Like. Slipping something like this into the Cosmere, I don't in the Cosmere do the don't ask questions part, right? I say, mm-hmm. well, this needs to fit with the lore and the world building and things like that. So it's yeah. one of the reasons why this has never uh, shown up. I mean, I'll, I'll stretch <laughs> sometimes. I'll be like, you know what? What's Why does this work this way? Magic. Um, but that means you're writing fantasy. There's yeah. got to be some room for that, even in a very hard magic system yes. like you use. Um, but yeah, uh, Apocalypse Guard... Um, book two, if we ever get yes. around to that, I've told you what I want to do with you that. You want to do Big House. I want to do yeah. Big House. Mm-hmm. I'm on board with that. I've got a good, did I give you the yeah. plot for you it? You gave it to me. It's good. It's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Big House, dear listener. Um, Brandon, back when we used to play RPGs every week, um, we finished a D&D campaign and he said, okay, I've got the next one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't remember what you called it. But we ended up calling it Big House because we started, all the players began as essentially um, blanks. Yep. Blank slate characters. Blank slate. Woke up with no memories in a dark blackness void. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that we were gods who had lost our powers and were trying to regain them. And we were in a an entire world that was just a house. And mm-hmm. so, like, the mountain was actually a chair and things like that. We were trying to find the great city on the pool table, which yep. I don't think we ever got to. We played that game for, like, two years. We did. And uh, it did the, the thing that I like to do, which is really hard to do with an actual gaming system. And so I kind of have to jury-rig my own, which is mm-hmm. what your characters do becomes your class. So yeah. as you play the character and flesh them out, what I I, I like regular role playing just fine, but uh, I love this idea of you know rather than always just building a character and then playing it, seeing what kind of personality develops for your character, what kind of things your character fall, what role they fall mm-hmm. into in the group, and then building a class that naturally grows out of what they're doing. Um, yeah. Big House did not work as well as our pirate one. Big House was like the first try dry run at this, mm-hmm. um, and the pirate one ended up working really well. Pirate one worked well. We mm-hmm. played that one, I think, even longer. Yep. Um, once I realized that you were that we were gods, yep. that you had done this as mm-hmm. we're lost gods regaining our powers, mm-hmm. I started claiming divine everything as part of my yes. portfolio. Mm-hmm. And at some point, I remember you looked at. Because you very studiously took notes because yes. you were trying to make our classes reflect our mm-hmm. characters. And I had claimed like 40 different things. Yeah. And the other players, maybe one or two. And then you limited us to only one thing per session after that. Yep. Um, so. But the one of my greatest victories, mm-hmm. uh, we were attacked uh, by something or no. I can't even remember the situation. But I claimed that I was the god of Cthuloid Monsters. Evil tentacle monsters. And then like a year later, we got attacked by a kraken. And I said, oh, I'm the god of that. And you're like, what? No. And looked through your notes and said, oh, crap, he is. <laughs> and then I got to control it. Yep. <laughs> uh, that was a, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was great. Do you want to talk more about role playing? Role playing? Yeah. Like RPGs and stuff. Sure. I mean, this is something that was fundamental to both of our childhoods that mm-hmm. I don't think we've talked about. Uh, I don't on, think we have. And it's become really foundational to your adulthood and yeah. less so mine. 
Yeah. Um, at some point, you had to give up role-playing games in order to make time for other things. And I am now literally a professional game master and uh, game writer. So Yeah. I gave up... I. It, it sounds like I'm I'm making some great sacrifice, and it's not. There's a, multiple reasons. I loved role playing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, still have very fond memories of it. But as I became a novelist full time, I found that all day I was writing, and I was feeling the same, doing the same work that it takes role playing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, imagining characters, being a character, guiding. Even if you're not GM, it, there's a certain emotional effort that comes into being another character yeah. uh, that was really fun. It was, you know, exercises, exercising a part of my brain that I really like to exercise. But as mm -hmm. I was doing that all day, I found that role playing, I was starting to really um, dread because I was exhausted of the same thing. And I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. At the time, I'm like, you know, this is too much time. I need to be spending this time with my family or whatever. Um, so I'm going to bow out of the weekly role-playing session. Uh, but looking back, I realized this was the bigger deal. Interesting. Like, I could have made time, and my family would have let me make time if this were something yeah. that was really, really important. But I, I came to him, and I was exhausted. Now, were you player or game master? At that point, I was player. Okay. I had been game mastering for a while, but then uh, Micah kind of took over, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think you were in these sessions. No, not, um, not more recently. No. Yeah, this was after. Yeah, um, this was the the my roommate Micah, uh, Captain Demo yep. from uh, Miss. We love Horn. Micah. Um, he was an excellent GM, and he ran basically a a role playing game for all of the roommates. So it was me, Ben. The mm -hmm. how's that Ben Ben? Yeah. Um, Micah, uh, our mutual friend Earl, who's a very good friend. My brother Jordo, who didn't live with us, but he would come to role playing. Uh, mm -hmm. And occasionally you, or occasionally I, I other people. Occasionally yeah. joined uh, mm -hmm. th during this period, but that's yeah. when I still had very little kids at home. Yeah. And so, but I I gave up GMing. Micah was better at it anyway. Um, and I, but I was I was exhausted. Like. The wrong kind of exhausted, right? Yeah. Like you can go to mm -hmm. role playing exhausted from a different type of work. It's just, it's the same thing that I ran into when I tried to take a programming class at BYU. That I would do my programming homework and then sit down to write my books. And I'd be like, oh no, that part of my brain is exhausted because I've mm. just done it for several hours. I am not interested in writing. Yeah. Whereas other types of things, writing would be a relief to get to. This is this is really fascinating to me mm -hmm. because I and this is probably the reason that we have diverged so much. Yeah. Uh, role playing for me, uh, for the most part, is very much a relief. Mm -hmm. It is something that gives rather than drains energy. Yeah. And I s suspect part of that is just different approaches to it. That we do it in different ways. Yeah, it's got to be. Um, like I, I have not been a player in a role playing game in forever. I'm mm -hmm. always the game master, and you know, as a pro GM, I've got something like five or six campaigns running right now. Um, and so for me, it is not the writing part of my brain; it is mm -hmm. the panel moderator part of my brain. Right. You know, I can totally understand that. Yeah, which is, hey, all of you people, let's mm -hmm. get you together, and I have kind of hit this point where I am exclusively doing published adventures. Okay. Be it Pendragon or One Ring or D&D &D or whatever. Uh, and I can pull that out and say, okay, this is the next thing. And then just let you guys collaborate and I will be the bumpers in the gutters mm -hmm. to keep you from running completely wild and corral the story a little bit. Yeah, that that is a difference, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, for me, role-playing is a creative expression. Even GMing is a creative expression. When I GM, it's not the characters. I want the characters to ha to be able to creatively express their narrative, mm -hmm. but I want to give them the world to do it in. Yeah, um, and that's you know probably not surprising if you know me. Um, but I, I want this world to feel interesting, and I I also want the mechanics. Like I I don't love running other people's mechanics. I like coming up with the game mechanics that are wacky and weird mm -hmm. and uh, seeing if this works and yeah. if it's fun. 
Big House and the Pirate Game were all homebrews. And so was Spaceways, the other big one that I did. Yeah. Uh, you weren't part of that one. I, I wasn't part of Spaceways, yeah. but I've heard mm-hmm. of it. Yep. So those were kind of my th- three big homebrews. And they didn't... Uh, so the first one, Big House, kind of cribbed off of other rules. And then mm-hmm. the next one was my own system completely. Uh, I'm still very proud of it. It was kind of dumb. <laughs> um, but it was all about it up- worked. upgrading your dice, right? Yeah. Uh, it was about uh, about upgrading your dice to bigger dice to do diff- better things and uh, things like that. But it was complete mm-hmm. homebrew, uh, yeah. rules included. And and something like that can work really well when you've got a group of friends who've been mm-hmm. gaming together forever yeah. and they all buy into it yep. and they're not going to try to stress test the system. Yeah. You know, we weren't out to really break it. It's about that. Uh, it's a... It's the framework for collaborative storytelling and um and yeah, and that's 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 part of the fun for me, and that is a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Um and so I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. What was your first role playing experience? Uh ever? Yeah. Uh I imagine same as you. It was uh Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It was TMNT. Mm-hmm. I think we've talked about that before, so you we know that. But how did how did it happen to you? Uh, so there is a uh, kind of venerated comics store called Comics Utah in Salt Lake that it had at different times has had three or four different locations. Uh, one of them was just a couple of blocks from my house in Sugar mm-hmm. House, where I grew up. Um, and we would go there all the time because um, my brother and I had gotten into miniature wargaming, kind of, sort of, but right. at a very basic level. Uh, we found a miniature war game magazine and we were completely delighted by this idea of, you know, toy soldiers on a map turned mm-hmm. into a game instead of just freeform. Was it one of those like World War II ones? Yeah. Because those were really popular it, it, back it, when it we were It was the kids. historical yeah. war gaming idea and, and we just were, this, this magazine kicked the whole thing off. We bought the little green plastic soldiers mm-hmm. and painted half of their helmets blue and that was our armies and then we discovered comics utah and went there and found all the warhammer stuff and this was you know early mid 80s so it was the kind of old school warhammer stuff and got into that and then stumbled across this ninja turtle thing kind of right before the ninja turtles were right. oversaturated right you know before they went mainstream did you were you playing when the cartoon started, or had the cartoon already started? I think the cartoon must have already been there because we recognized TMNT when we saw okay. it. Yeah, because uh, but- for me, I got in right before the cartoon because I remember when they're like, the cartoon, I'm like, they're making a cartoon of this? It's so violent. How are they going to do that? <laughs> um, See, so. and my experience was different mm-hmm. because the game was based on the Eastman and Laird comics, which were yep. basically pastiche of... Yeah, uh, you know Frank Miller, Batman, and Daredevil. They were, um, mm-hmm. and so we had this very goofy cartoon, and then here was the cool grown-up version, but still with mutant animals. Yeah, and we just thought that was wonderful because I had read the uh, the or uh, the initial run before mm-hmm. Eastman and Laird went off and did other things and kind of handed it off, uh, and I had them as graphic novels. Oh, that's um, cool. When the cartoon started. Um, and they were well worn, and I'd read them multiple times. Um, and then found the game. No, the game got me into those. Oh, okay. So the game happened because just some friends in the neighborhood are like, "Hey, there's this weird thing. You you get to make your own animal, and it has like ninja powers." And I'm like, "Oh, really?" And we didn't <laughs> play it that first time. We're just like, "Here's the random thing. You've got an armadillo." My first yeah. one was an armadillo. armadillo. I think. Armadillo. Uh, I'm like, cool. lucky. In it's my experience, a, yeah. almost everyone got a bird. Mm-hmm. They're there's so First many birds. Time. So many birds in that game. There's so many birds, and there's so many like versions of house cat and dog. I think like dog. Yeah, dog so, like, breeds. Yeah, like if you roll the randomization, you are more most likely to end up with uh, some sort of domesticated animal and or local yeah. fauna. Right. Yeah. So getting some an armadillo kind of was thing. was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so we got into it that way. That mm-hmm. it, that was our first introduction to role playing, and it was just my brother and I stumbled across it and went nuts. And we started to collect 
uh, basically Palladium stuff from that point on. We had Ninjas yeah. and Super Spies. We got into Heroes Unlimited. Beyond the we Supernatural. Into, uh, I actually didn't get into Beyond the mm. Supernatural until uh, the second edition, okay. which was during college. Um, but we did went we we went hard into Rifts. Yep. Uh, we did too. We, yeah. After Rifts came out, but Rifts came out a little bit later for me. Maybe it was already mm-hmm. out and we discovered it later. But I went from TMNT to um, D&D mm-hmm. because it's like, well, I guess we should try the one of these that is. And like I did TMNT when I was too young to really role play. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I later on, after kind of getting into it, reading the comics, not really playing that much. Right, but having the books, yeah, uh, and then that kind of got in. I got into fantasy fandom and things like that, and that's when I'm like, "Hey, I should try D and D." Why have I never tried D and D? And so I went and bought AD and D, which was the the one to buy then. Now, uh, second edition. Were your parents worried about D and D? Because they mine were, were. Not. yeah, uh, and I think that's why we stayed Palladium for so long. Not just uh-huh. because they were great books and great games. But also, we ne- I never got into D&D until mm-hmm. I met you in college. Okay. Um, and playing with you and Eric Ehlers, that was the first D&D I'd ever done. Okay, yeah. And that's with uh, third edition. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's in part because my parents were nervous about it. They, they still, you know, I don't think they thought that it was evil. Uh-huh. But they'd heard the things, and they were kind of right, nervous, and they the were like, you know, the, the Ninja Turtle stuff is yeah. fine. Even... Rifts, which is overtly horrific and about like yeah. possession and devils and stuff, they were fine with. And D and D, they were like, eh, it just makes me nervous. I mean, we uh, we played uh, we played Stormbringer. Uh, so oh, like an Elric game. Elric game. It was really <laughs> nihilistic. The, you want to talk about a nihilistic game? Uh, we tried Call of Cthulhu. Um, Call of Cthulhu was a bit beyond our role playing uh, skills at the mm-hmm. time. Let's just say, um, but uh, yeah, we tried. After I tried D anD D, I started just being like, "Hey, let's try all the different systems." We, I would say, Palladium was the, still the one we did the most. Yeah, uh, the most of. Um, we tried so hard to make Rifts work. Um, <laughs> for those who don't know, so Rifts was we. There are all these separate. It's basically. The MCU of game of yeah, gaming. Yeah, they, they were doing multiverse at Palladium yeah. before almost anybody else was doing multiverse. And so the idea was they had all these cool books. TMNT, uh, which later got renamed After the Bomb. If you want to buy it now, it's called mm-hmm. After the Bomb because they lost the license. But it's um, it's this idea of mutated animals um, doing cool things. And yeah. then Beyond the Supernatural was like Indiana Jones meets you know, X-Files, horror. X-Files, yeah. but before yeah. X-Files came out. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good pitch on it. Mm-hmm. And Heroes Unlimited was roll up a superhero and save the day. And then they came up with Rifts, which was like, what if we had portals to all these different worlds and you could bring all of, because we build them all kind of on the same fundamental mm-hmm. uh, framework. And we brought you all together into this one world where there were space Nazis who were trying to take over the world and you got to fight the space Nazis with your Robotech jets and your ninja from yeah, uh because uh, they had the Robotech license as well. Yeah. They had everything. And your mutant bird and your wizard from uh from Palladium Fantasy. Mm. Uh we're gonna bring them all together. And it did not work. Uh <laughs> it did work, but the game and the company did not give you any tools or guidelines of how to make it work. Okay. You had to really like police yourselves and be very careful. How did you make it work? Because we tried, because my brother was really into Robotech. He's like, mm-hmm. I want to be a Robotech guy. We're like, great, roll up a Robotech guy. I wanted a ninja. I rolled up a ninja. Guess what? <laughs> uh, the yeah. guy with a giant robot full of missiles that can destroy tanks and the ninja do not play in the they same campaign very well. well. Yeah. Not as teenagers. Adults, we could totally figure out how to make that work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but as kids, we're like, oh, Either there have there has to be a battle for him to fight against giant robots mm-hmm. while you're fighting these other things. And if any stray hit comes from over here, it vaporizes you, right? Because yeah. the damage done to giant robots is so high on a different scale and order of magnitude that a single die roll of a one mm-hmm. vaporizes any other character who doesn't have uh they had yeah. mega damage, which was they like had normal damage, and they yeah. had mega damage, which was a yeah. hundred times more powerful. Yeah. Which was kind of their way of explaining why 
you couldn't take out a tank with a knife, yes. even if you attacked it. Which is smart. For hours on end. And it worked just fine if everybody had a giant robot. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, um, the way we could make rifts work was we did have to apply constraints to ourselves. Okay. You know, the very first time we did a role-playing, uh, a full rifts campaign, mm -hmm. uh, we had like, you know, one guy who came to me secretly and he's like, okay, my character, I want to play a dragon because you could play dragons. Yep. And mm -hmm. they were stupidly overpowered compared to the rest of the yeah. races in the game. And he's like, but I don't want anyone else to know that I'm a dragon. And one of the main dragon powers is shape-shifting. And so he said, you know, if I just say I turn invisible, what that really means is I just turn into a fly and everyone thinks I'm invisible. And, you know, we tried doing it that. It sounds and, like a Brandon and, thing to do. Yeah. I, I would it, get along with this this person. <laughs> yeah. That was Gabe. Mm -hmm. Um and we tried doing that with, you know, the the wizard and the the robot and the, all this other stuff. And it was just a mess. It was a nightmare mm -hmm. to take care of. And so we ended up kind of settling into something that forces you to be a little more, um, you know, circumspect about your power level. Which, yeah. on one hand, is kind of ignoring the potential of the world, right? Mm -hmm. If the idea is that everything can exist and you want to play a Robotech, and you can't, then you lied right. to me, game. But on the other hand, if everyone was at the same basic power level, and then you had to go find a Robotech and get it to right. work in order to fight a bad guy, you were still able to bring those elements in. Right, that's the, the higher level of kind of adult role-playing that you can be like, let's tell a collective story. How can we figure out? And mm -hmm. that, when we figured that out in college, it's when role playing like leveled up and became a different experience. Yeah. Um, it's not about who has the coolest character. Because as a teenager, there's a bit of you that's like, uh -huh. who has the coolest character? Definitely. Um, it instead turns into, oh, what is the story we're telling? I often point out like the big, one of the big revelations uh, and changes in mindset happen for me when uh, it was this college role-playing session. And it started again with me and Micah and Earl. And uh, I think Ben was in that one already, but he might not have been. Um, actually, uh, there was um, there was a Jennings. So there oh, was a Jennings okay. in this group. Uh, Nathan, not Nathan, Ken. Nathan, I assume, yeah. Because uh, Ken had already moved out. And so Nathan Jennings, Ken Jennings, Jeopardy guy. Uh, Nathan's um, uh, was my roommate for longer. And he was in it. And so we did this thing. And Earl's character died. Mm. Um, kind of my fault. I was the wizard. I was supposed to save him. I said, I, I got a spell ready. And then something happened, like I critical whiffed or the, the, the owlbear critical hit it or something. Yeah. Earl got his head ripped off by an owlbear. Uh, <laughs> and this was traumatic for Earl. Mm -hmm. um, and so years later, when we were rolling up new characters, he's like, can I make one that just can't die? And Micah, the wise role-playing um, guy that he he was, is like, or, maybe I was GMing. One, one, I think it was Micah. This, it was Micah. This was the half troll, right? This was the half troll where he's like, all right, what if you just had a half troll who can regenerate from anything? And then Earl's like, but trolls can get killed by uh, fire and acid. And uh, Micah's like, all right. You are a half dragon, half troll, so you're immune to fire because you're a red dragon. Mm -hmm. And we'll let you start with a ring of acid resistance. <laughs> uh, and Earl's like, great, I'm on board for this. And as kids, we would have been like, his character's overpowered. Um, and as adults, we're, like, we're understanding that this is something Earl needs mm -hmm. to know his character can't die. That's not fun for him yeah. in the game. And so Earl became our test dummy. Yeah, Whenever I, we I actually to... was in yeah. this campaign mm -hmm. for part of it. And uh, yeah, we would tie a rope around his waist. Yes. And rather than check for traps, we would just have him walk into a room. And have and them all go off. We'd pull him back out and he would regenerate and go, okay, there's things over here. There's fire that spits out over here. There's big blades that come down from the ceiling. And then we'd be able to go in and deal with it. And it actually worked really well. One character was massively more powerful than the others in a certain in a certain category. Mm -hmm. There are places you can do this and places you can't. And the character not being able to die is a huge advantage. Yeah. But it turned into an advantage for the party and a narrative device rather mm -hmm. than his character is cooler than my character, which was really great. And it was yeah. one of those lessons that you learn as a role player that's like, oh, 
let's not be about who's better. Let's be about telling a story together. Yeah. Uh, it, it helps also that Earl is not the kind of person who tries to steal the spotlight yeah. or dominate the story. Nope. Um, and also, I remember we thought of it at the time as, well, this is basically just Wolverine, but without claws, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah. he's a purely defensive Wolverine. Yeah. Uh, and so his ability to affect the world was still very limited. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, you're right. It that That is such a key moment. Uh, for role-playing gamers uh, when they really level up into, oh, this is communal storytelling. This is not competitive storytelling. Yes. Um, and But as kids, we could not make that work with Rifts. Uh, we because just Rifts is yeah. really... Um, one, one of the problems I have, and I am a dyed-in-the-wool, ride-or-die Palladium fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are something on the order of 90 Rifts books, and I think I'm only missing four or five of them. Okay. I have a grotesque collection of Rifts and Palladium stuff, but I also recognize that it does have its faults, and one of them mm-hmm. is, um, you know, similar to how the moral of Marvel's Civil War was uh, this system of freedom can only work if everybody acts like uh, Captain America. Yeah. Um, Palladium games ultimately only really gel if you run them the way Kevin Shembieta does. Yeah. Okay. And and he has a very specific style of role playing. That's why his experience system was so weird. It's because he expected you to play the same character for 17 years. Uh, And so if you were playing one of his games with him Everything clicks into place. And if you are just a normal person who looks at the sheer overwhelming power gaming potential of Rifts with no guidelines of how to navigate it, then yes, everything falls apart immediately. Is Palladium your favorite or is it just more the most nostalgic one for you? Like, do you have a favorite system or a favorite game system? Mm hmm. Um, my three favorite role playing games right now, and mm-hmm. I don't know if I could choose between them, are King Arthur Pendragon, okay, by Greg Stafford, um, Star Trek Adventures, which is a 2d20 game from Modiphius, okay, and The One Ring, second edition, okay, um, which is an Italian game currently put out by Free League. Uh, which is a Swedish company. Haven't played any of them. No, you haven't. Nope. Um, and they're, I mean, they're all kind of based on known properties, right? I guess mm-hmm. King Arthur isn't a property so much as just a known legend. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what really sells me on a role-playing game, what gets me excited about it, is if the game mechanics are designed to create a specific tone or incentivize certain behaviors. Right. Um. D&D 5 is fun and I love it. D&D 5 is a combat game. Right. You can do other things with it, but the rules and the characters are all designed around how are you going to kill this monster? How many monsters can you kill in a day? How many times can you heal yourself back up? And so it incentivizes a very specific type of play. Right. Roll for initiative. Type of game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I love games that... Uh, incentivize other things. Not because I dislike, again, D&D yeah. 5. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, but The One Ring is a game that really goes out of its way to put you into the mindset of Tolkien's books, where hope is as important as combat prowess, hmm. where the ability to make uh, a honey cake that makes people happy is just as valuable as the ability to kill an orc. And they do a really good job of that. And it's a totally different style of play that you can't do in any other system. So I love games that do that. Mm. What did you think of D and D four point oh? Let's uh, let's let's lay some groundwork <laughs> let's, here. Let's so, get controversial now. Um, I never played D and D one point oh. Um, one point oh was back when I, I'm going to get it wrong because I never played it. But as I recall, it's like your class and your race were the same. You played an elf mm-hmm. and an elf was a certain type of uh, character. You played a dwarf and it yeah. was a certain type of character and things like that. And it was very influenced by Chainmail, the uh, miniatures game that gave rise to it. Yeah. Second edition um, is ad and right? Mm-hmm. Um, and second edition is the one I played. And it was really complicated um it was real weird 
uh, to figure out if you were going to hit something, you had to do some really odd uh, math calculations. Um, and it had all these weird things, but it was very complicated. But also, uh, it was the first real role-playing game. Mm-hmm. Um, third edition is the lightning in a bottle, I think. Third edition is where it really exploded. It came out when we were in college. Yeah. Uh, it simplified a lot of the rules, but not too many of them. Just kind of this right amount where you could really feel like you were going to play a wizard or a fighter. Um, and it was still combat-oriented. It's D&D. Yeah. Um, and it was it was the perfect game at the perfect time and sold mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands sold, of copies. Sold a ton. And yeah. that was the very first version I played. Like mm-hmm. I said, I didn't play until you got me into it. Mm-hmm. Um, I had never played the earlier ones. Five, in my opinion, and five is actually, um, I, I think it's the best version. Mm-hmm. You know, I've only played three. Four, if you count 3.5 as its own thing. Um, and it has outsold, I think, Every other game on the market combined. Five is a legitimate Powerhouse. defining phenomenon. Because yeah. um, four, I didn't like. Four, I, yeah. Four, so many people didn't. I mean, that's where Pathfinder came from. Yeah, people didn't um, like four. Is because people didn't like four and they I wanted to keep out playing out three, four. five. Yeah. Back when I was exhausted of role playing and, mm-hmm. and not interested, I that's when I dropped out. So then I haven't role played yeah. a single time since, it, unless you count the time I broke out TMNT and rolled up characters with my kids just to show them what <laughs> yeah. role playing was. Now, see, that, knowing mm-hmm. that that is what killed you was yeah. four. Mm-hmm. Um, on the one hand, it surprises me that it was the the burden of storytelling, right? Uh, because the reason that everyone else disliked four was, was because it was so it was basically a tabletop miniatures game. Well, it's it's a combination of factors, right? It's the time factor, mm-hmm. newly married, starting yeah. to have kids, mixed with feeling like I've done this all so many times before, mixed with not having fun at mm-hmm. the game sessions because the game sessions are not designed to do what I have fun doing. Yeah. Um I I have fun in D in, in role playing mm-hmm. by coming up with a quirky character who has a weird relationship with the rules and a weird relationship with the other characters Mm -hmm. and then leans into that over the long term. Yeah. uh, And is useful in unexpected ways. That's the kind of the brand and key thing. See, and so many times I have thought to myself, I bet I could get him back into it Mm -hmm. if I introduce him to one of these really kind of story-based narrative games. But they are missing the key element of quirky yes. relationship with the rules because you are kind of not a power gamer so I much am as kind of I'm a I'm a Johnny yeah. by magic terms they mm-hmm. have this thing a character who likes to look at the rules find the weird thing interactions mm-hmm. and then build everything around those weird interactions yeah uh, and so if I this is the problem I've tried some of these very heavily narrative games and they're fine but it's like telling writing a book. Mm-hmm. I can do that all day if I want to. The one thing that role playing offers that a book doesn't is this rigid set of rules that I have to somehow game, not mm-hmm. to be the best carrot player, but to do something nobody's expecting. Yeah. Um, and that is really fun to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one of our our last big D and D game mm-hmm. that you were in, we played Eberron. Yep. And you were a wizard. But in the Eberron universe, the elves are like ancient things and they revere mm-hmm. their dead and they have necromancers. And so you were like 300 years old. I was the oldest you could make a character. Yeah. And took all the disadvantages of age. Um, and abused the crap out of the the follower rules. Yes. So that you were, you had a bunch of other little elves to carry you around yeah. on, a, on a palanquin all the time. And it was all about... Breadth of arcane knowledge and using that follower rule, just going all mm-hmm. in on that. Um, and I was pretty useless until climactic battles happened. Yeah, I, I was really good in a couple situations, non combat situations where I could make a spell do something it's not supposed to do. Uh, <laughs> like the classic Brandon move is oh no, the door is locked, we can't get through the door. 
Uh, do you have an unlock spell? I'm like, I don't have an unlock spell. That's not versatile enough. Let's try the shrink spell. We'll shrink the door on its hinges <laughs> or expand the hinges and get the door off, right? Like mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. If I can get the weird spells that I'm like, ooh, a shrink spell. What are all the things I can do with a shrink spell? Uh, what can I do with a fireball other than hit people with it mm -hmm. uh, is what Brandon wants to do. So I'm, yeah. I'm good in all of those situations. And then the climactic battle when all the stops are out, it's like, all right, now we're going to have the big climactic moment. And Brandon's been saving up all of these items that he's <laughs> bought and never used. And then it's Sander Lanch in, uh, in gaming mm -hmm. form. Yeah, which is a delight. But that's um, what I like to do, and a lot of these systems don't allow for yeah. that. So, like, f for a while, at last year, actually, mm -hmm. leading up to your birthday, I was like, okay, what if I get Micah and Ben and Earl and all the old team together, mm -hmm. and we do a role-playing game with Brandon for his birthday, and I was going to try to do Blades in the Dark, mm -hmm. which is a very cool narrative. We're all criminals in, like, a steampunk world mm -hmm. full of ghosts uh and i just i couldn't figure out which character you would want to play which was the sign to me of oh there's not a weird corner of this rule system that he's gonna screw around with mm -hmm. um you know and now that i've said that someone's gonna tell us in the youtube comments oh right. he could do this and this and blah but yeah um because that is a key part of what attracts you to it Yep. Uh, I and I think this is very similar to the way I play video games. I am not interested in challenge. I'm interested in story. And so for me, mm -hmm. you know, my big um, uh, D and D character that I actually still use sometimes was when we did the monster campaign, and I got to be the mummy, who was a paladin of himself. He right. was the god of justice who had died yep. and then been brought back to life, and he became a paladin of himself. So he was the good guy, but he was also you know, animated by dark energy. And that's just a weird concept that I thought was delightful, and we played with that forever, for years. I love those concepts, too. Yeah. Uh, but I need that rules component on mm -hmm. top of it to really be enjoying myself. And the other thing is... I feel like I've done it. It's one of those things I've done so much mm -hmm. that I, uh, um, I'm kind of done. Yeah. Um, like the idea, maybe someday I will, uh, I will role play with my kids or something like this will happen like you talked about. And I'm like, oh, I'll do a session or something. But in my head, when I think of role playing, what I think is that was a lot of fun. I've been there. I've done that. I'm no longer interested. Yeah. Um, I've covered it. I've done everything I want to do. Uh, <laughs> and now I basically have a job where I get to do this. Yeah. You get to tell stories to yourself. Yes. All the time, all day, every day. And make so. up the rules and the ways to break them. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, it is important to point out that um, what eventually happened with our gaming group Mm -hmm. was that we could not both be players at the same time. We could not. Uh, because, you know, as as evidenced by, for example, the Star Wars game, we played West End Star Wars, which still one of my favorite systems yeah. ever. But it fell apart real fast. That's the one that died. <laughs> be, it, it died so fast because of us, because mm -hmm. you and I were, were bad people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you wanted to be a Jedi. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be the... Quixotic Jedi, yes. because that was one of the cool archetypes that I'd never done and I thought was so cool. The guy who thinks he's a Jedi, but he isn't, right. which is such a Dan character. Yes. Uh, and you wanted to also be a Jedi, but again, breaking the rules, you said, well, can I be a Sith? Yeah. Who's actually like raised on a world where the Sith is the only religion and he thinks that that's moral and upright and good. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up being your mentor trying to teach you and, oh man... Yes. It destroyed everything. My name was just Darth, I believe. <laughs> uh, you named me, and you're like, come along and understand. And I'd be like, Master, is this where we get out their entrails? And you're like, yes, Darth. I believe this is. Because you, you know, you just like. I didn't know. You didn't know. You're my, just pretending. My you're, character you're, was crazy, yes. and he was the only moral compass provided to your character who was inherently evil. Yes. And our it was Alan was the game master yep. of this, and he had no idea what to do with us. It was it was a big old mess, but you and I had a lot of fun. <laughs> we had so much fun. But oh it, man, it was delightful. It, it it broke the campaign for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that campaign did not last very long. 
But, Alas. But there's a there's a name for a podcast. Dan and Brandon can't both be players. <laughs> Dan and Brandon ruin everything. How's that, Ben? Ben. <laughs>